We're going to talk about ships today. Specifically, all the ships that are coming up in this new year. Because there are a lot. There are quite a few ships we know about. So that's th that's what we're talking about today, the ships we know about. Because honestly, the monthly reports haven't given us much to go on this far in the future. But like the stuff that the company has already told us is coming in the next 12 months is pretty wild. So we're really going to just review that today and look at the stuff they've said over the last six months or so about those ships and what we know about them. If there are any guesses, maybe in chat, if you want to throw some out there, or if any come to my mind while we're watching this, maybe we'll go on, a, on some deep dives. I think they're more aptly called tangents, <laughs> or we'll go into some of the past Star Citizen videos and see if we could find some more proof and evidence. But we're really touching on the known ships and vehicles coming to Star Citizen in 2024. We're going to start here with an Invictus chat from last year. This is the roundtable talk they do every Invictus, which is like a big military ship event. So you generally they're talking about military ships, but they also spend some time talking about the ships that are coming up. And we're going to jump around this conversation a little bit because there is there are a couple of mentions of different things that we're going to be interested in. But let's start with them, just what they have to say about the actual ships they know are coming out. And again, remember, this is from June of last year, so this isn't necessarily speaking from the context of when I'm publishing this. Don't get that. Don't get that mixed up. Can you just can you just give us an update on ships that are what you would consider in active production as opposed to like pre-production? We know the Polaris is what we consider pre-production. Yeah. Somebody is on there scoping out the work necessary before it moves into production. But what's in active production right now? We're in the danger zone here now. Yep. <laughs> I'll, I'm, I'm going to slowly do it and look at John. As I okay, see. So there's, there's, there's Redacted that's on Josh. Yeah. There's Adam. Will I talk about that one? Uh, I'm trying to think what Adam's doing. Uh, <laughs> Who knows? Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. We've got <laughs> too late. <laughs> too late now. Yeah, yeah. On that one. <laughs> I, I was pretty sure. I was pretty sure that one was safe. Um, so we've got the Spirit in. What else do we have? In? SLV just finished art and design. So these are yep, ships yep. we've already gotten. Hull C. Yep. Hull C. Gotten that one. Uh, in its final teething. We've got some. Pages. More, more redacted that were on Chris. We got that. Got <laughs> well, what else is it? What are the US work? X, X1. Uh, What's the US work? X1, X1 we got. out to start. Uh, See, they, they, they kind of try to stick to like a six month outlook, yeah, I the think. Storm is. Storm's, storm's done. Through production. Oh, he did it. He did it. Oh. No, it was in the segment. It was in the episode yesterday. Oh, oh you said oh. the storm is coming through. Yeah. No, uh, we actually. Uh, we missed, we missed a narrative bit. It's, again, some of those things that missed through. It's like, in case you guys didn't catch it from the from the episode, uh, you know, the the, the, uh, the Tumble Storm is in a concept promotion right now as part of the Victus, but it is already in production yeah. with the uh, LA. Well, yeah, well. Anybody use well, the Tumble Storm or like the anti-air one? The end. That was not concept art. That was the actual white box and well into gray box uh, stuff. It's looking great so far. They're doing the Sun Talk. Santok well. Yai, uh, that one's into. We'll be updating for the Santok. We got all these we'll ships already. We're showing you an update on the Santok Yai for Alien Week in just a few weeks. Pretty sure that's all of them. Uh, Retaliator stuff we're doing, we talked about before. G12. Uh, G12 will be going, so in, in the next year, backlog ships that will be going into production. Caveat, things okay. can always yeah. change. Yeah. Uh, Polaris, uh, Apollo, G12, Raylan, X1s. I, I'm noticing something conspicuously absent. The, um, the, 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 I don't, don't know what you're talking about. Ban, 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 ban new. So we'll talk about the merchantman briefly, because uh, we, we discussed like how, how we want to do the backlog of capital ships. Uh, so we want to want to start with RSI, uh, because doing the Polaris first helps reduce the amount of work needed for the Perseus. He said the P the word. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, those three will likely be like a, a chain of dependencies from each other. Kind of shared assets. Yeah, between. there's a lot of shared assets right. between them. Obviously, the exteriors are like, quite different, but you do an RSI hall kit or corridor kit, floor kit, doors, doors beds, beds. Yeah, it all gets reused across them, maybe with some slight material differences. Uh, so there are a few things that were problematic with the BMM. Uh, firstly, everything is unique. Everything. So it's not like we do one corridor kit. It can't be for, modular. Yeah, it's it can't so be modular. It has to be shapes. unique. Yeah. Nothing on the ship can be modular. Every yeah. corridor, every room. Everything's unique. Oh, so nice. the amount of time investment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
There's some chairs, but even then yeah. some of the chairs we couldn't reuse because of the shaping of the rooms. Yeah. So like molded something. Yeah. Right? There's, there's so like it, lots of everything. It was so yeah. There, we had a lot of people on there. Uh, we had some unfortunate people leaving, uh, which they've been here quite a while. So we. He literally. I'm just gonna get a little bit ahead of myself here. Um, that that's what he just said right there. Is they talk about it at Citizen Con like four months later. This is a, <laughs> I think this is a big statement they really wanted to get out this, this past year that like, hey guys, this stuff, the, the ship stuff, we're working on it, but they, they're clearly working on it, but they hit a snag here. Actually going up. Um, See if I can find and, the part where know, he's talking about that. More team members, that also means we get kind of like, not just more people to throw at stuff, that us to kind of tackle up. There is a, a little dip. You will notice there in 2022, there is a, a little dip. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, when, when that happens, that has kind of real consequences on what we are able to do as a team. I think, you know, less people, so less power to put on stuff, but also some of that knowledge leaves us. With that, that leads us to have to make some... So that's something that he then... Like, that's what they're referencing here in Invictus Week last year. We'd lost a lot of sort of that team knowledge and part of rebuilding the team. Uh, obviously, effectively, again, like we said, you don't get new staff members go, hey, welcome to the Banu Merchantman. Here's a completely <laughs> yeah. thing that does not follow any of our existing art guidelines. Yep. And all the time we would have put into that was, would be just for that ship. Mm -hmm. We get no reuse from it. So yes, we will, we will do it again, but personally, I think the time is better spent on other capital ships to get people up to speed, and then we can start putting people back on it. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of love within the team for the merchant yeah. room. I think it's except yeah. for the picture Mark took a bit. Yeah, apart from Mark's the FOV. The FOV on that. Record. I'm yeah. never going to hear the end of that, am I? No, no. Yeah. no. no. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, there's a lot of excitement there for it. It's just making sure that, again, like we said, that the team's set up to succeed with it, and we can actually deliver it to yeah. the standards. Why don't we check in on where they are with the merchantmen since they're talking about it so much? For those don't, who don't know, this is one of those ships that when I'm like, oh yeah, they, um, they really need to, like there are some ships that they should have delivered by now. This is one of them. Let's go back real quick through history and um, see if we can find the page where they announced this thing. All right, so this ship was announced in 2013, it looks like. Looks like the earliest post is November 2013. Can't even display it because <laughs> because they gotta use Flash and it's no longer supported, just to give you an idea of how old it is. Um, and obviously it looked a lot different, like just to give you an idea, this is the first concept we ever saw of it and this is what it looks like now. So like a lot of people are rather perturbed by the way that it's changed in style. Come on, give me a... Obviously everything changes from in-game to concept but you can see that it's much more rounded out it's much more civilian and less aggressive than what they were showing us back then and a big part of this is like it was 2013 they were making things to look cool that's they did that a lot that's a lot of the stuff has changed since then in terms of art styles and in terms of lore and like the people who own this ship who make this ship are like the most peaceful people there are so it this looking kind of Van esque a little bit, a little more aggressive, doesn't fit as, as much with them. Um, I'm guessing it also was more difficult to make this in-game than, than what they've made. Like, they've made some art concessions based on probably how easy it is to do, and also just changing art styles, and that's, that's, that's rubbed people. But as you can see, this was announced and put on sale more than 10 years ago now. It's over a decade. Um... The promised Banu Merchantmen was released for a sale. Banu traders are renowned for their merchant prowess, traveling the space lanes and trading with everyone from humans to the Van Duel. Their sturdy, dedicated trading ships are prized beyond all transports, sometimes passing from generation to generation of Banu. Pick up a Banu Merchantman for a whole new star citizen experience. Yay! Cue the grunt birthday party yays. Drazen, thank you for the sub, dude. That deserves another grunt birthday party yay. Appreciate you, man. 38 freaking months. <laughs> oh my god. That's like almost as old as my niece. Not quite, but almost. That's that's a long freaking time, dude. Cheers. Okay, 2013. What is this page? 
Does this even still exist? Nah, it's a 404. I wanted to see if there was anything earlier than that. But it doesn't look like it. At least not on here. But yeah, this is an early, early ship. And it's 650 freaking dollars. <laughs> people, paid, people paid a lot for this thing. Um, so quite rightly so, people really want to know more about it. And it was worked on and hyped up for like a ton of 2022. And then the person working on it left. And they were like, okay, you're not going to get it. So it's now on the back burner. And here is really what they had to explain that this citizen con. But this is the latest we know about the merchantman. And we'll see where it goes from there. With the merchantman, just to show where we were up to before that happened in 2022. So you can see like they have a lot of organic sort of shape and architecture and the style is completely different from anything else in the game. So that's what they're talking about when they say we can't just throw new people onto this ship. If somebody else leaves, we have to make sure to get other people. It's like it's like asking a newcomer to come into your game and or come into your company and build a new piece of construction material that your company hasn't made yet. Like, they don't even know how your company works enough to do that. So they have to build the people up to do it, and I guess that takes a while. But there's also, as a point was made in, in the comments here in the live stream, there's still a lot that's going to need to be done for this. I mean, you're going to have to be able to run a shop on your ship. That single seat there was a turret. So this, uh, this seat here is yeah this is the the turret there's actually a nice shot of this in another let me see if i can look this up real quick there's a nice shot and explanation of how that sort of looks the way it does i think in this video change to the animations yep i'll have to <laughs> this ship is huge see they did a lot of coverage of this thing this is 22 yeah um, because they were expecting the launches at the end of the year, this year, and this would have made them so much money at IAE that year if they had gotten a launch. Here it is. Check this out. Entry way to get inside the main man turret. This is kind of one of the rooms that we spent a bit of time kind of playing with in white box and making sure we got it right. Uh, we really wanted this to kind of feel, um, yeah, like quite a moment walking into it. Uh, yeah. Go on, Jared. No, no. It, <laughs> okay. Even even in gray box, this is quite a moment here. Yeah, there, there was some really nice bits in the kind of concept where you had these kind of like um, these, these like lit walls, and we tried to kind of pull some of that into. And I think it's almost having that kind of moment of um, uh, like solitude before you kind of get yoinked up into to battle. Um, so it's you know quite a lonely area of the ship everywhere else on the ship kind of feels like it's it's built for like like mark was saying like the family whereas this is kind of very purposeful you, you know what you're getting into as soon as you walk in that room and obviously the exterior shell there when all said would, done would open up and reveal yeah. you to the 
outside. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so these an, animations an thing about they're not showing us. These animations from the top are pretty cool. I don't know if they show it in this video. It's Man, we've the... really seen a lot of coverage of the Merchantman because I'm just trying to think of the different videos where I've seen what I'm thinking of. They showed um they showed some shots of the the out the exterior opening and closing. I don't remember where that was. Is that not here? Look at how big this cargo freaking area is. Stored. Look at this. As you can see, the amount of cargo that the what ship the? holds is colossal. <laughs> and these are one SCU boxes. So like this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't know how how tall is a thirty-two SCU box. Four tall. So this would be like the t the height of a 32 SU box, I think. So what is it? God, I don't even know the dimension of that. But like, this is a ton of cargo. Oh, holy crap. <laughs> Amount of cargo that the ship holds is colossal. And just the Although sheer I don't volume think it's more than it the whole thing. This cavernous, cathedral-like view of being stuck in the rafters of a, a warehouse worth of stock. Yeah, it gives you a real sense times, of how tall two. the ship actually is. Uh, when we get to the, the, the market. So it's um, too tall. Okay. You kind of get a glimpse at that. Wow. It's not until you get Oh, so these might not be... No, these are 1 8th SU. I'm sorry. Yeah, you can see the, the distinction here. I thought these are 1 SU. I thought they were, the top was right here, but I think the top is right here. I think. Now I'm confused. I th I'm pretty sure these are 1 8th. And something like this that spans... The they didn't even have 1 SU the back then. Got a hanger above the, <laughs> back the in the day. Um, about how, how big the ship actually is. Well, we're not going to be able to go through every single room and nook and cranny today. This is too big a ship. So let's go to the market now and take a look at that. So right. Think, so um, yeah, this is I'll let them explain what a lot of the kind of customers are going to see when they first walk into the ship. It's this sort of like reveal um, of the market area. And what we try to do in, in, in this area is um, kind of everywhere you walk into it, you're kind of um, walking through a, a small tunnel or you know, quite a tight space so that when you kind of do walk into it, it does then open up and you can see that sort of like that that grandeur and that height of the ship and you know this is only two out of i think it's five or six floors at this point of, of you know the, the part of the ship you're in um but i think it's just a nice kind of like reveal of the the, the overall kind of uh again just repeating that that size and that verticality that, that we see in the other areas of the ship um i think we've already shown a lot of the concept art of this area already um, but the idea here is that you've got this, you know, hollow in the middle that will kind of, you know, will allow um, the the uh, the traders to kind of show off some of their um, items. So we're going to go back to the other video I was showing you from CitizenCon, and you'll see this area updated. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a very exciting area of the ship, this part. Okay, and the last area we want to show you today is, is kind of the area that we spent a little bit more time on. It's a little bit further along. We tried to take some areas... Actually, you know what? No, it's not updated. They basically just re-show you all this stuff in a more cinematic look. I'm pretty sure it's all at this same stage. Because he said they were showing us the work that was done when their artist left. So I'll just show you this again, I guess. Key area that you can kind of refer to as, as you know, yeah, this, this is what the Merchantman's all about. And whilst each area of the ship will have its own feel, will have its own kind of uh, style and in its own forms, um, I think this is a good indication of um, the kind of elegance. And you know, if you imagine this is the crew area and the uh, guest area is going to be a level above this, um, I think it gives you a good idea of, of what we're aiming for. The other thing is with the Banu, they're, they're very communal in how they actually... Right. Let's go back to the other video. Because like the, men, the Merchant Man is not the only thing that might come in next year. I think it's actually one of the less likely things to come next year, but I just wanted to cover it because it's here and... It will come up.
Yeah, see, this stuff all looks pretty much the same as it did. I don't know. Yeah, but when though? I think he's going to talk about that now. <laughs> so that video shows you know, where we got up to with the merchantman. You can see we finished white box. We were kind of into gray box. Some areas were further than others. And I think one of the best things about working at a company like Cloud Imperium Games is that we're able to be pretty honest and pretty open with our development. One of the biggest questions we get is, what's up with the merchantman? Where is it? Why did it stop? Um, and you know, the merchantman brought a lot of unique challenges to us. It was a completely new art style, something that's very, very different from what we normally do with our human manufacturers. I think you know, we could have paused other ships. We could have moved some of our other artists onto the merchantman. But with the kind of exodus of our kind of senior team in 2022, um, we didn't just lose people, we lost a lot of the knowledge that went into building out that white box and really kind of delivering that art style. What we decided to do at the time is rather than try and rush something out and just get something out to, to get it done, we looked at where we were and for us, the most important thing was growing our team back up. We wanted to invest in our team and use our seniors and our kind of managers to help get us up to the point where you know, we can tackle multiple large and capital ships at one time. I think the graph previously kind of showed that you know, we've got the head numbers now, and now it's about onboarding our new staff members. It's about skilling them up and getting them to the point. And I would absolutely love to be stood here on the stage and going, yeah, look at the merchant, it's amazing. Like, it's, you know, it's done. Um, but we're not at that point just yet. We do see all the comments. I do see all the, the notes about it. And, you know, I absolutely want to get this ship out and done. Um, and, you know, we'll, yeah, I just wanted to be open and honest as to where we are up to with the development. Yeah. Uh, to, to add to that, it is probably the most question I get asked at any event. And I really want to get it done and get it out for you guys. But we don't want to give you a half baked thing. We want to give you a really great product. So this isn't coming next year. Of, and it's delivered alongside gameplay. So, let's talk about something else quickly. <laughs> let's talk about something we can say is coming next year. All right. So, this... <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's such a funny transition. I missed that when I was there. Um, so, now we're going to get into the Idris and the Javelin. But before we do that, let's just finish up this Invictus talk real quick and see if they mention any other ships. We expect. Can you imagine training new people on developing a brand new art style for yeah. a ship. Because like, it, I, I generally think Merchantman is going to be one of the hardest ships we ever do, just because of all the additional factors that involve it, the, the scale of it, the, the fact that nothing is really reused, it's all unique molded. All the for the record, all... I think they are totally taking the ad advantage of the fact that they lost the people who could finish this ship. Yeah, they're going to make a new, they have to train people and get people up to the standard and make sure they figure out how to build this ship. But the the unword word, the unsaid words here are that they also need to do that for the gameplay, right? We all know that this is there's no way this could launch in the next year and have the gameplay they want planned for it. No, not a single person following Star Citizen thinks that we'll have enough NPC crew capability by the end of 2024 for a brand new merchantman to run correctly right or is that a thing do people is there is there a conspiracy i don't know about you'd have to have the ability for these npcs to dock with your ship come aboard talk to you buy stuff and then leave i just don't see it so i think they're also taking the opportunity here to like work on this ship on the gameplay side as well and i agree with you guys in chat it's going to be a little while it's that 
it's a different cool like, art style. style of modeling as yeah, well, right? Yeah. In terms of our like actual discipline of like how we make ships. More organics. Yeah, it's like more like traditional vehicle modeling like yeah. than it would be like um, a hard surface weapon. Yeah, it's hard surface meets organic and yeah. yeah, yeah. it's and automotive. Strange, isn't yeah, it? I say we we we'd, we'd worked on that process and we had a good process in place and it was just unfortunate that someone chose to they chose to go off and chase new adventures and you know, wish them the best of luck and you know, a big loss to the team. But um, you know, that that initial kind of pre-production was done and it's and it's there. It's just we just need to get to the point where we can still deliver our current like line of ships we want to deliver and we want to be able to do it justice and it just takes a bit of time. And keep on top of bug backlog. Keep on top of bug backlog. Uh, feature features. support because we're we're constantly yeah. supporting other feature teams. Like you've got the track there was a lot of work with the tractor beam, there's a lot of work with the salvage and there's other features coming online that we have to support and all of them are time, lots of time investment from our side to actually implement them in the ships and stuff like the, the resources. Yeah. We, 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 didn't, we didn't get to it. One of the things we discussed uh, well, that I want to talk is when I talked about how we balance those things. It's like this, we'll, 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 we'll do another one of these when it comes time for uh, IE probably in uh, November. But we, I definitely, there's definitely a place for a in-depth discussion of how we balance that workload. The balance between new ships and ships that are already on backlog, balance between giant capital ships or ships that are an entirely unique uh, art style versus that s those same people at the same time could crank out four other ships in the same period of time. How do you balance that? And then of course, you know, all the gameplay balance implications and 197 yep. different vehicles now and, every, and uh, yeah. you know, and adding more and more, you know, balancing, you know, their capabilities and stuff. So there's, there, there's a, there's a video like this that can just be all about balance. And I think we'll, we'll probably pursue that uh, down the line because it's a conversation. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. We, we got some of that, uh, right here. Um, so that's, I think that's mostly what they talked about when it came to the Baron of Richmond. I want to move on from that ship because like I said, this isn't coming next year. But let's look at the Idris and the Javelin. This was a small segment during CitizenCon that is actually a pretty big deal to some people because the <laughs> Idris and Javelin are the biggest ships we can own, at least that we know of right now. These ships are huge. The Javelin is... <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> oh, man. Anybody who's, like, not, not been introduced to this ship. This is, like, the definition of of insaneness for star citizen like from the beginning the idea for me that made star citizen so crazy was actually the same idea that made star wars galaxy cool i guess is that you could have a spaceship that other people existed inside of and this thing is so big <laughs> that's what she said it's so freaking big it is 480 meters long and it takes a crew of 12 to 80 people so you could just get like 30 of your friends and go off in space and wreak havoc. Now, I don't know what the heck you're going to be doing to be able to pay to run something like this, because the upkeep, the weaponry, the fuel, the engineering costs, everything that you're going to have to do to pay in order to keep this functional is going to be nuts. But it is a ship that we can buy, and it is a ship that we will be able to control and fly in the game. Unbelievably, it is a $3,000. So, don't don't buy it <laughs> unless you want to support the game like it's just there's no way that's going to be worth it um unless you are coming from a big group and you guys are like pulling pooling your resources together but here they have a little bit of a presentation about these ships because they've existed as well for like 10 years now they're part of the original pitch of this game at least those first couple of years they're a big part of squadron 42 and that's part of why they've held them back so here's their sort of explanation as to what's happening with these ships over the next year How many of you have an Idris of some kind? <laughs> uh, right. So, we plan to deliver the Idris alongside the squadron, alongside squadron, and that doesn't mean just the M. We're going to deliver the M, the P, and the K kit all together in one delivery. Javelin owners, I'm afraid, you're going to have to wait a bit longer after that, is obviously the bigger ship players can own. Uh, and we have recently looked at what is left to deliver on it. We've got plans. There will be modularity with it. Um, and yeah, that will come after squadron releases. And those of you who also have 
uh, the Vandal Scythe, Glaive, Blade. After Squadron releases, you will also get the updated uh, models as well for that. Yeah, so the, the actually, these are pretty cool. Let's take a look at the, oops. <laughs> Just completely moved where the video was. Let's take a look at that real quick because visual teaser. Because they look, the, the updated models look pretty nice. Check this out, check this out. Come here, come here, check this out. Come here, come here. Get closer. Here we go. Oh God, I'm so sorry, your, your poor ears. I'm sorry. Told y'all to get closer and then I messed them up. So these are the new Vanduul ships and like they look... Man, I don't know if I can find you guys a picture of what these used to look like. There we go, Vanduul. Vanduul Blade. So yeah, you can kind of see this is what these, these ships used to supposed to look like. And now they look like this. So they've changed the style up a lot. And we haven't seen, like this is, sorry, tabs, tabs, tabs. This is from 2019. Like we still don't know really what's going on with them, but clearly they're done with them and they're going to update them whenever they get into the game. So a lot of updates are going to come to ships when Squadron 42 goes through. And I'm guessing it'll also lead to a lot of the gold standard reworks for things like Retaliator and Saber and Gladius. Next. Okay. No kind of ship panel at CitizenCon event. All it's right. Kind of done. So that's about that segment. That was real quick Squadron 42 video segment, I guess. We're going to jump back into October. We had a couple of small updates on vehicles here that I'm sure people are excited for. The first is actually our bounty hunting ship. So let's all remember fondly might I add, the very small hints that they've been dropping about new um, bounty hunting functionality coming to the game. We have this restraints. here. So with the restraints, Some restraints. Okay, let's take them down for it. One more. Oh. Okay, so with the restraints, we're going to turn him over. We're going to cuff his hands. We're going to cuff his legs. Now, if he wakes up, he can't chase us down, right? But he could call out for help. So what we're going to do as well is we're going to add places in the environment where you can stash a body. You can hide them, either in unconscious or dead. And there were, that way, it should be easier to remain undetected and keep you in that stealth bubble. Um, now, this is another thing we talked about in the UI demo, uh, which is the ping. Okay. And so in that's part of the um, bounty hunting stuff we've been starting to see. And I believe I've got something else. You know what? It's going to be easier for me to just look this up in my own files. So these, let me see. I actually might be able to look up the time. Uh, this was in April of 2023. Let's see if we can, because I do want to see what they were saying about this. This is also some, some of the hints that they're dropping about bounty hunting. Don't worry, this will all make sense very soon. April, 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 April. And down on the surface of Hurston, work is underway on early white box phase of local law enforcement offices. A place for players to utilize the next evolution of bounty hunting gameplay we'll discuss more about later this year. To collect, or in this case, drop off the captured bodies of criminal outlaws collected by players. Now the drop off here is right up front. Because in early tests, it was getting kind of weird just walking through the hallways, pushing bodies deeper and deeper into the facility. So these pods you're are key. Sort of thing. You're going to notice them a lot more as we realize, or as CIG, I guess, realized throughout their the design and development of bounty hunting that um, it's going to be, there needs to be a, a universal area they can put bodies instead of you just dragging bodies around and throwing them in your ship. And they came up with these body pods. So we'll see in a second here how they've changed one of the most iconic bounty hunting ships to accommodate for that. Or go forward into the shop and resupply as needed.
And there's an office for meetings, but who needs more of those in life? And then we bring ourselves to the detention area, where a number of cells can vary from location to location. I suspect that many of you will be looking forward to spending your time anywhere else besides Kleischer, even if it's just a jail and not a prison. Also in white boxes, okay, the pre-production... So, there's a lot that goes on with, with bounty hunting, and they still haven't really... I don't think there's a design document for this one. Um, they've been a little bit mum about how it's supposed to work. But it's probably about time for us to put a video together because they've they've like slowly let things out. Basically, we know that we're going to be tracking people down via uh, services like um, air traffic control, or I guess space traffic control. I don't know. Um, security systems and pings, comms, comms arrays and stuff like that. We will have to go and specifically locate our targets, restrain them and take them back to an area. So the game loop itself is going to go a lot longer than what it is right now, which is basically just legal murder and we can see that here with one of these older ships it's the hawk which released in like 2017 or 2018 they didn't know what bounty hunting was going to look like fully but they had an idea and here's how they're changing it let's keep our tour of potential gameplay changes to ships going with the anvil hawk now one of our team members on the eu vehicle content team recently completed a first pass sprint revisiting the hawk to explore a potential new methodology for loading and unloading what I'm just going to affectionately call the Wanted Fugitive and Stasis Cargo Containers, or WIST for short. <clears throat> the idea being that once you've captured and contained your prey in the WIST and set it down behind the ship, this articulating arm would then come out and using the power of electromagnetism, suck the into its grasp God. and pull it up inside the vehicle. Yeah, all this for the for the width. Ugh. Looks pretty good. <laughs> all right, so it should be noted. So okay. yeah, that's mostly what we have on bounty hunting. The other side of the information we have on this game uh, mechanic is actually the virtual AI side, if you don't know that. It's basically just... It's like, um, remember Shadow of Mordor, where they had like the, the nemesis system. If you killed someone or interacted with somebody, they'd remember you. There are supposed to be virtual AI going about the game that have like a memory that sticks with them. They commit crimes. Those crimes stick with them. They have a reputation. It sticks with them. They buy things. They sell things. They encounter things. It sticks with them. And those people are supposed to be able to rack up bounties. And those will be some of our targets as well as players, but... They're probably going to have to go a lot more into detail on that because that was the information on that is two years old and it's from Tony Z and it's probably changed throughout the design process. But yeah, that was that was a little update on the Hawk. There's another pretty key update here. <sighs> another big crowd favorite, the RSI Apollo. Look inside the white box progress of the RSI Apollo Medevac, which is currently in production. And I still think the Apollo exterior looks too damn cool to be a space ambulance. John, Ben, I'm gonna need a, 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 a fighter or, 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 or a smuggler variant. I would really, really love and, a no, general purpose ship that looks like the Apollo. But I feel like the way a lot about a lot of ships, I think it's, it's nice that the ships don't do everything for everyone. Um, man, yeah, an exploration ship though, that looked like this would be awesome. Here is kind of a better, look into this ship now as mentioned um this was in production but may have been paused as of right now so it might not come next year but i do think there's still a possibility that we could see it 
This is, again, one of the less likely ships, I think, that we'll see. This and the Merchantmen specifically, I think, are further back, as well as another one we'll talk about here soon, the, the Gatak Raylan. But um, I still think there is a possibility with this one. So let's take a look kind of at what the point of this ship is and what the devs were saying about it back when they introduced it five years ago in 2018. Concept ship to Star Citizen. Let's go Hairless to the ship in Foundry 42 UK studio and let them introduce us to the brand new Apollo medical ship from Robert Space Industries. The RSI Apollo is a new medical ship. It's from RSI, which didn't get a new ship in a long while. We have two medical ships at the moment announced in the game, which is the Cutlass Red, which is basically the ambulance in our game, and the Endeavour with its hospital module, which is really massive and really end game. So we needed something in between. We had quite a short timeline on this one for a medium ship. So really early on, I did a quick sketch of the interior, passed it to um, concept artist and was like something like this and it kind of stuck basically um, and it works well with RSI styling. The ship still has its flow you know it's still quite sleek and sexy but you know it's it's got all that it's got that all that angularness to it. It's like a Lamborghini turn it into a spaceship. The RSI Apollo is basically like a small clinic that you can go to the edge of space. This has a capacity of six patients with six beds uh, a crew of two at the front with two ejection beds. I do really like the idea that like this is your actual clinic as opposed to an ambulance that's flying around. This might actually be the place where that ambulance brings somebody out in space. That's cool. I, I really hope that there are, they build missions that teach us to do that. I don't think, I think a lot of the sandbox gameplay is going to be niche unless the missions push us towards that. So I hope that for those kinds of weird situations, we do have a couple of missions that kind of let you know, hey, this is a way you can use this ship. It has a size 2 turret on the top of the ship at the rear, which is more a point defense turret rather than something made for dogfights or anything. And this is a remote turret. It has also 28 SCU of cargo at the back. And then you've got medical bay space. It's always that sort of fine line between sort of reality sci-fi and gameplay. So it's, okay, we need to basically spawn a player here but we don't want him popping in so the player will be delivered there's a glass cover on top sort of um, protecting the, the player the thought process is that we'll have essentially like an, an opaque glass when there's nobody in it and then you'll, you'll hear noises and probably lights will come on and the thing the bed will activate and then a person will arrive and the glass turns uh, transparent and you're like okay that you know the bed's occupied at least that's you know, I wonder, I wonder why that's not how everything works right now. I guess that's something that they'll do when they want to do the polish pass on all these hospital beds. But right now you just pop into existence. That's a good idea to make it seem like they didn't pop in there. They were transported in some magical fairy dust way. At the moment, it's kind of like a self-healing unit. So you'll have a, a disc that, that scans, scans the person, finds out what's wrong with them, heals them, and then, then it opens up and... Off they go. And so with this ship, you'll be able to pick up people, fix people up, get them back <laughs> out the door, you know, so it, it can be... Look at these know. eyes! Look <laughs> I, can I get this in the character creator? <laughs> Obviously, there'll be medical gameplay. That we plan is, even if regular ships can do something with medical gameplay, or like a player could help other people in the future, you will need medical ships if you want really to pursue the medical career in the game. Um, the final result, I'm really happy with it. And it's just sort of going through it basically. And so that's just been a process of refinement, just pushing and pushing and, okay, add this, tweak this, you know, all the lines. Generally, you know, you generally try and avoid parallel lines. We've worked hard to do a good layout that will please every player and that is really aesthetically pleasing as well. So I think this is a really good ship and this is bringing new kind of gameplay. So it looks good. Do you know what? I kind of like playing the medic often. So, you know, I, who, I'm not quite sure how this will turn out in our game, you know, but I just want to see it. just want to see it in game. We still aren't either. So that's the Apollo. 
And real quick before we finish up on this ship, let me let me show you guys what medical gameplay looks like real quick. Um, medical gameplay, Star Citizen, because it's pretty underdeveloped right now. <laughs> I've got a thumbnail or I, um, a guide that still pops up on it. You know, this is the first video that Star Citizen ever shared from us that I know of at least. And I think you have to submit to their community hub, but it was like a solid year and a half after I posted it. Um, let's see. It's just really weird timing. I do appreciate the share. I, I not that that's a bad thing. It was just like so much longer afterward. And I guess it's still relevant because this hasn't really been updated since 315. Um, for those who don't know, 315 was a massive update for us. It was the first time we have an inventory. First time we ever had a healing tool. First time you could really ever do anything other than stab yourself with a med pen. In fact, you could, this is the first time you could stab other people with a med pen. All these new drugs. Um, the injury system was introduced. So the idea of injuries being that... The idea of injuries is to complicate your FPS experience without taking you out of the game. So... One thing I really like about 322 that they've done is when your health gets closer to zero, it stops going down as much when you get shot and you just start taking more injuries. And the idea of injuries is, is supposed to be that you're taking repeated damage to the same limbs and they'll balance it out over time, but it allows for a medic to be on site personally to always know what to do for each injury. And there is a method of manually balancing the drugs. Right now they give you some auto method, but... There's enough gameplay here to allow somebody to actually specialize in delivering the right solutions for the right problems. And I think they're going to go further than this with more unique kinds of injuries. But from here, um, really, we don't have too much. And I think that's why we haven't gotten the Apollo yet. Whenever we get the Apollos, probably when we see an update to the health system. And that's that's why I don't know if we're going to see that next year. If we were going to see the, a new health system next year, I think they probably would have talked about it during CitizenCon in some way. With all the FPS stuff going on. And especially with the radiation that they talked about. The actor status T2 system includes a variety of new elements such as hygiene, NPC status tracking, multiple bytes, DNA integ integrity, medical insurance, cybernetic limbs, and cloning. So that's our next update. Um... I don't think any of those things really point towards an Apollo. So I don't know if we're going to get this next year. But it's a cool ship. And it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. But how about we move on? All right, let's jump into the big list of ships. This is the most exciting part of this whole thing. Because we get to look at all the ships that they say in rapid succession are coming to the game in the next 12 months. And it's quite, it's quite a list. I will just add to that as well. Oh. We aim to deliver everything you see in this video and more in the next 12 months. For the record, I'm really hopeful that this is Tumbrel. Um, and I'm hopeful it's not treaded. I, I want this to be a hovercraft because I think it looks really cool as a hover bike. I hope it does. We already got these. The X1 came out with 322. Uh, a lot of theories that this is a medical Ursa. I think there have been some mentions of that, but I'm not quite sure. But it would be interesting. They focused a lot more on ground gameplay, and they're showing us more outposts that are actually within driving distance of each other now. This is, I think, just pointing towards the modularity of the Argo SR um, PTV. Um, no, not PTV. That's the gray cat. Uh, Argo MPUV. This is actually, for those who don't know, this is the MPUV cargo. Um, this is, you can either put a passenger transport or cargo transport in here. You'll probably also be able to detach and put like a 32 SCU crate on here. So this is more talking about modularity coming to the game next year. I guess we have a racing G12. This is a big unknown. Nobody really knows what this is. It does look like... I mean, it, it's obviously... Um, 
I won't say obviously, it looks RSI to me. I'm seeing the shape language of a Polaris in Constellation here. Um, I'm seeing a bit of the Dorito shape that we expect from RSI ships. I think this could be an RSI. It's kind of large. Uh, this dude is probably, what, two meters tall? So this ship is probably like a lot of meters long. <laughs> um, this is, is going to be a surprise ship, though, next year. I'm guessing this is something... I don't want to say it's military, but it could be. You know what this actually looks a lot like to me? I think um, also the Nautilus. Is that what I'm thinking of? I think I'm just looking at the landing gear there, though. It could be a lot of different things. You know, that's the thing is like we can trust the design language in terms of silhouettes, but this could turn out to be a lot of different companies. We've seen companies make ships that you wouldn't expect. RSI makes the Orion, like kind of wild. Side ramp? Does this look like a side ramp? I think this is just a block out, sort of breaking up the shape language a little bit. Here we have a new ship from Mirai. This has been leaked, but we don't really touch on the leaks too heavily here. Um, and this one is also pretty large. This one's going to be... It, it's pretty obviously from Mirai. It looks like the Fury... And it's something. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but we'll see this sometime next year as well. Ah, <sighs> okay. Let's talk about this. This is a little bit of a sleeper, not as commonly known. And it was introduced, man, it was introduced and it was so quickly, that is not how you spell that word. It was so quickly left behind as, as, a discussion point at all. This is like, well, I'll let them explain to you all. This is another, I don't know if it's going to be a profession, but definitely a part of the gameplay in Star Citizen. A big part is hacking. And they have been very, very quiet about hacking over the last year and a half. Here's really the last time they talked about it in any level of depth. something that we've not done in Star Citizen before. You're going to be forcibly boarding another ship. Now with the Mwah. ships, it's always mechanics, but right. So the Anvil Legionnaire is our new ship. It's a uh, it's a boarding ship. It's for a two-man crew and then eight people in the back. And basically, it's essentially for a hostile takeover. I think this is a very. I mean, let's sort of let's be honest. This is your this is your alien. This is your dropship from Alien, right? With a little bit of Pelican thrown in there. Iconic looking ship. Which let's. <laughs> that's, that's, really where, cool that's where the Pelican got it. The experimental phase. You know we you know we had like sort of crazy crazy arms. Yo, they are going to have to release a uh, a coffee book with all of this art, right? All of these concepts and stuff that they've done. Oh my god, the freaking concept art book for this game is going to be insane. It's going to be crazy. I like pretty sci-fi pictures, okay? So I'm a, I'm a fan of those kinds of books. Things that could basically sort of latch onto ships. But, I mean, ultimately, because you've got to take into account uh, all the other ships that are in the universe that can be boarded, you kind of have to come up with a really sort of simple universal system which is kind of why on this legionnaire it is such such a simple um, uh, mechanic essentially the legionnaire fills a, a gap in our lineup Last our music for both i fill in the gap more lawful and less lawful careers where you need to take charge of another person's ships Traditional flow for ship to ship docking is the, the person who wants to dock to the other ship requests it from the parent ship and it's on the parent ship's uh, pilot to accept or deny that. Whereas the Legionnaire has onboard uh, hacking abilities in the hacking minigame to perhaps forcibly override that uh, acceptance. So 
it's fun to cross-reference, right? It's, it's good health for everybody. What he's talking about here is basically as a legionnaire, you'll be able to get into a ship control over each door and take head. over this sort of display. You'll be able to, if you're, if you're really good, I'm sure there's going to be some level of like, oh, you got this far, you can control life support, you can control gravity, you can control components themselves. But the idea of hacking is that you'd basically be tricking the system into thinking that you're the person who deserves to have access. Um, you're spoofing an identity and it's going to give you engineering access. So this is also part of engineering gameplay, which is maybe why those two things have both been sort of aligned in their development branch. Um, but maybe they'll talk about that here too. Allowing it uh, to happen instead. For players that are on the, the, the lawful side, um, its prime use is bounty hunting. For those perhaps with more more military focus, it is like Anvil's dedicated military boarding ship. Uh, and for those on the other side of the spectrum, it, piracy is its main, main role. So you are there able to uh, attach and board other ships and take their crew goods or ship itself. That's that's the Anvil Legionnaire. Uh, looking forward to this one because it's a, a ship that appeals to to both sides of the law. Uh, it brings with it uh, a new side to an existing gameplay loop or existing gameplay loops. It expands upon them, and it's something that I know a lot of players have been waiting for a long time. Is that the ability to board other ships uh, forcibly because it sort of it takes away that safety a lot of players have at the moment where. I'm, I'm safe on my ship. No one's coming on here without uh, without destroying me. Uh, so people are really going to have to start thinking twice when these things hit the persistent universe. That's true for so many different things no, too in this game. We're going to have to... This game's going to get a lot more sketchy. Uh, not sketchy, because like a lot of the systems coming online will protect us too. But this game's going to get a lot more... Real? gonna experience a lot more things like hacking be, be the idea of being hacked nobody's thinking about that the idea of being boarded or even emp'd or interdicted when you get interdicted in this game you're just like really <laughs> seriously um and all these types of things are going to become more easy to do and easy to get away from but more common so here's the q a on this ship i think it gives a little bit more information on the actual capabilities of how this thing can hack and, and connect. So let's take a let's take a moment. Let's read through. Join me. Join me. What conditions must be met must be met for the legionnaire to hack? For example, does the target ship have to be immobilized and its shields overcome, or can it dock mid-flight? The answer is the conditions are the same as current ship-to-ship -ship docking as featured on the constellation in Merlin. So the ships must be aligned and are oriented correctly. This can be done at any speed, although the slower the better. So basically there you you're gonna have to disable the ship somehow. EMP, probably. Um, planned range. Somebody just asked what the planned range was. This is still to be determined based on testing, but expected to be relatively close, like a few a, a few kilometers, not dozens or hundreds. So within the distance that you could be killed. And you'll probably have to be in SCM mode. How can players counter the Legionnaire's hacking ability? The hacking mechanic is intended to have gameplay for both sides, both hacking and counter hacking. In instances with no other player present, attempting to board on NP ship, uh, an NPC ship or non-legionnaire scenarios such as hacking environmental setups. That would be like hacking into a, a, a space station or a, an outpost or something. The counter role is performed by AI. Obviously, a very good opportunity for AI blades would be players who can just have an AI blade that's always counter hacking. Um, besides that, I'm guessing this would be the kind of thing that you would want to have for your co-pilot to be around. So like... While the pilot might be doing all pilot navigation stuff, the co-pilot might be in charge of... Maybe your co-pilot's your engineer. You know, maybe they're monitoring systems, keeping hacking under control, missiles, all that kind of stuff. It's I don't know if they're going to have a standard way they expect us to do this, or if they're going to let us lay it out ourselves. I know they'll do the latter. I don't know if they'll do the former. Um, but I don't think you're going to have just somebody having a hacking role in your ship. So figuring out who does what is going to be an interesting challenge in this. Let's see what else they say about it, though. 
Um, what can be hacked on the target vessel? For example, will we be able to disable or activate self-destruct, open and close airlocks, and manipulate thrusters? They say, these systems are dedicated to specific and directed tasks of overriding and overcoming the docking and air traffic control systems of the target ship, which is which in-universe is sufficient challenge by itself. They are not able to address the other command systems of the target ship. So when it comes to hacking the ship with the engineering like I was talking about, that is not going to be the case for this ship. That's just normal hacking. My bad. Good thing we read the Q&A. But um, hacking will be something that you are using... So really, this isn't a hacking ship, it's a boarding ship. Hacking is just part of the boarding process for them here. That's actually a, that's a good distinction I will remember to make too. The Legionnaire fits in extra small hangars and pads, so it's a pretty small ship. I think that's smaller than the, um, the Valkyrie. It can be used against ships that do not have an airlock, such as the Crusader Hercules. At this point in time, we are only committing to it being able to breach dedicated airlock entry points. Good to know. Will the docking tunnel on the Legionnaire provide any cover for its boarding team? These, there are deployable covers built into the tunnel. That's cool. Does it have crew facilities? No, this is a short range ship. Complete a mission, return to base. What equipment can be transported for the boarding team? There is space for heavy and special weapons and heavy armor. Working with the core gameplay pillar to ensure that if heavy armor cannot be worn in the seats, as not all seats will have this restriction, that is, that is a thing, by the way. Some seats you won't be able to sit in with heavy armor. Then it is the least impactful place to allow quick equipping before boarding. You cannot disguise yourself. Um, hacking and boarding mechanics unique to the Legionnaire or will be available to other electronic warfare platforms. The com combination of hacking and boarding is part of the Legionnaire's default setup. So while other ships may be able to get the hacking ability, it would be at, I think the MSR is going to be able to hack in order to steal some of the data they're looking for. Uh, it would be at the cost of other blade-controlled electronic warfare war roles. So I think these blades are the subcomponents of your computer and will share space with AI blades as well. The Legionnaire has it built in as opposed to these other ships using blades. For example, you could upgrade the Vanguard Sentinel to support ATC hacking, but you'd need to manually EVA over to board after that because they don't have the boarding tunnel. All right, how maneuverable will it be compared to the Cutlass Steel Prowler, Vanguard, Hoplite, and Valkyrie? Maneuverability will be closest to the steel. Wow, so a Cutlass, huh? But could be adjusted. How heavy is the armor compared to other ships? It's designed to take significant fire on approach, so it's relatively heavily armored compared to other dropships and much closer to the other Anvil ships, such as the Terrapin. Yo, you better watch it. Better watch it. You're not, getting, not stepping on my Terrapin's territory. Who controls the turrets and shields while the Legionnaire is in flight? The co-pilot is in control of one turret as well as the hacking system. Ooh, co-pilot's got things to do. And will the boarding mechanic be possible with an NPC crew or do we need real players? NPC co-pilots will be able to do the role if no human is present, as this is required for the counter-hacking gameplay on NPC ships regardless. The Legionnaire be able to use blades to increase its hacking power. Yeah, NPCs will be able to transition between ships, so I don't think that's a something to worry about so there we are this is the valkyrie boarding ship and one that is stated to be coming in the next 12 months we'll have to wait and see yeah a little bit of cheering uh this one is the Z is this the zeus i believe this is the zeus the, the zeus the zeus <laughs> And for this one, we actually don't even have to leave this video. We're going to jump back to this 37 minutes. Uh, we are going to hand over to Elwyn and Mark to go through this. And you can see there's three of them there. So we're going to do a bit of a deeper dive onto these three ships now. So over to Mark and Elwyn. Oh. Ask everyone welcome. Come on, let's go, let's go. Hi there, everyone. My name's Mark Gibson. I'm the lead vehicle content designer at Cloud Imperium Games. And I'm all about Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Owen Bachelor, vehicle art director in North America. What do you guys think? Looks like a spaceship. Awesome. All right, well, let's take some time now and take a look at this classic RSI design and see how we've reimagined it. 
So when we decided we wanted to tackle the Zeus, we had to consider what direction RSI would take it in if they were going to do it today. We couldn't just remake the original Zeus because although it was obviously a massive piece of history, all it was really used for was transporting and moving around. So we had to consider exactly what we wanted to do with the ship. In the end, we decided to go for three variants, allowing you to pick which way you want to actually play the game. So what we're going to do is talk about those variants that we decided on in the end and go into a bit more detail with them. First of all, we have the ES. The ES is the essential. It's the long-range exploration version of the Zeus. It's designed to let you go out for a long time and explore the universe. Man, they love using the, uh, the E word for... I feel like there's not really much that says this is explore. I mean, I guess this is exploration in the same sense that like the Cutter Rambler is and that it just has range and living situation. A robust radar package. I don't know if that means it's got higher higher level components or not. That could help. But I feel like I always hear exploration and I'm like, but why exactly? I do think that this ES is probably like the best sort of like starting general purpose ship. But they didn't really make a general purpose Zeus. It feels like the ES was as close as you get. But then we got the next one, the Mark, which is for bounty hunting, I guess, with an EMP. Next up, we have the Mark. The Mark is the bounty hunter version. This is there for you so you can actually go out, find your targets, and bring them back. It's also been purposely outfitted so that you have all the tools that you need to disable, capture, and bring them home. Finally, the last version we're going to talk about is the CL, the Clipper. Might be a name people are familiar with if they know much about Maritime. This is the cargo version of the Zeus Mark II. This is designed so that you can move your goods around the universe. Now this thing's crazy. Of the three variants... The, the cargo one, to me, this is going to be nuts to see what people do with this, because this could make a killing. Depending on how they do the jump points, this could be one of the highest capacity cargo ships that passes through a medium-sized jump point. We'll have to see. It's definitely going to put out a lot lower emissions than similar-sized uh, hauling capacity ships, but they'll talk more about it here. Move your goods around the universe. Of the three variants, the Zeus Essential is the one that harkens back the most to the original design with the original white on black paint job and the vertical stabilizers. We also worked to maintain the silhouette of the original, but brought that forward to modern day RSI design with tons of technical detail and layered panels. And on the underside, the landing gear and the underslung turret, as well as the entry. I am happy to say that I'm not super jazzed about this design. I'm just, I'm whelmed. I think it's a solid design, but it's not something that I'm jumping for. And I like that. I like not liking ships. You know, it's like, makes the ones you like a little bit better. But yeah, this thing's obviously more complex than like a spirit. Look at the interior here. Pack a lot into it to give everything you need when you're doing the deep space exploration. You have a fairly comfortable habitation recreation area so that when you're out away from home, it's not too unpleasant. In addition to that, the rear room has a 32 SU cargo capacity as well as being able to fit a cyclone. So if you do decide to land our planet, you can have a look around. Talking about the loadout, it's a ship designed for three crew. It comes with four size two shield generators, two size two power plants, two size two coolers, and two size four pilot controlled weapons. And obviously the lower turret that Elva mentioned earlier is a size three remote turret. Now the Zeus Mark was always designed from the beginning to be a sleek and aggressive bounty hunter. As such, the black paint will help you stay hidden in the shadows until you're ready to strike. We do like also the paint. redesigned the spine in order to embed If you could change those yellows to reds, I'd love this. Quantum dampener, which allows us on the art side to really crank up the level of detail on the exterior. We've also added a second remote turret on the top. Looking at the interior of the mark, you see that the habitation's taken a little bit of a hit. It moved forward, but what we've been able to add in exchange for that is a massive armory. Let you take How all is this smaller than the spirit? I don't understand. Like, I'm looking at the cockpit. The spirit's beds are like right here, and then it has a hallway, and then a cargo bay. That cargo bay can't be this big, right? Hold on, I gotta, I gotta look this up. I can't imagine this thing is... 
I know they were close. That's just insane. <laughs> They've packed so much into this ship. 46 meters in length. They're like the same length. How the f how? How is this possible? RSI. This is the difference between a, country, a company that's been making ships for 900 years and, and Crusader. I love Crusader. But the idea that this... <laughs> that this fits into the same space as a freaking spirit is nuts. What the actual f equipment you might need while you're tracking your target along with this. Looking into the rear, we actually have a dedicated area just for the actual um, bounty hunter pods, similar to what you'll see in the Cutlass Blue. So you can stack up the pods and take multiple people back with you. It has less SU than the ES. It only has 16 SU. And it does have a different loadout with the components, only having three size two shield generators. Like Owen said, it does have a top mounted forward facing turret so that you can put the pressure on the target as you're chasing them. The EMP and QD drive are designed to stop the target escaping once you've caught up with them. Now, because the Zeus Clipper focuses on hauling cargo, we've decided to lean into the industrial aesthetic. We've covered the exterior with a warning strip paint job, uh, and we've covered the exterior with more technical detail and armor plating. In addition to that, it comes with a remote tractor beam, which is mounted on the rear to the side of the ramp to make it easier to haul cargo in and out of the cargo hold. We've also added thrust capacity to the base of the wings. As huh. you can see, there is- I didn't catch that before. Thrust capacity to the base of the wings. Does that mean, um, Mr. Endomi, thank you for the raid. I appreciate it. Thanks for the support. Much love to you. I hope you're having a wonderful week. Happy New Year's to you. The base of the wings. So does that mean they added VTOL in here? Is that what he's talking about right here? That that thrust? Let's see if that's on the other model. No, it is not. So they added little... I don't know if you could call those VTOL. Oh, that, that's right here on the ES too, though. So yeah, I don't know... I don't know what he means by that, but maybe this thing has VTOL so it can stay hovering in atmospheric flight for longer. We've also added thrust capacity to the base of the wings. As you can see, there is an absolutely massive rear to it compared to the others. The habitation areas have been massively pushed so that you don't get much space, but we can get way more cargo in. It actually has four times the cargo capacity of the S coming in at 128 SUs of cargo. That's crazy. This one also features three size two shield generators. And like I mentioned, it has a size three tractor beam to make it much easier to get those cargo containers in and out as you're actually playing. What do you think? <laughs> so last year we introduced the Spirit. And if anyone that may be playing on their live, live the last couple of days might have seen a new ship adding to the verse, the A1. We hope to follow a similar route with the Zeus where we announce it today, and then in about a year's time, hopefully it'll be ready to reveal to the public to actually play with. But this isn't just the concept. We're not just going to show you some images. The Zeus is actually an act of white, dot, white box development right now. Do you just want to have a look? Shall we? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Do we have any caterpillar entrances into ships? It's interesting. You saw the ST variant, the Space Tomato variant? I saw that. <laughs> All right, so as you guys have seen with the Spirit and with the many ships we've released thus far, our ships can, when they're finished, look absolutely gorgeous. But before any of them get to that point, they have to grow through a very specific development process. And this is the first stage in that process. We call this white box. At this point, we've taken the concept, ripped it to shreds, and then reassembled it and plugged it all back together within the editor so that we can get a real good look at what players are gonna see when they finally get this game. At this stage, with the Zeus, we've already ripped out all the thrusters, we've ripped out the landing gear, the turret, the seats, the beds, all of the interior spaces, Plug those guys back in, and we have what you see here. This is definitely niced up for a white box. So again, the beginning of the process. 
At this point, we're able to jump in, start throwing in cargo, interacting with doors, getting in and out of beds, maybe in and out of toilets. See, like, look at this, dude. That What the... I don't understand. <laughs> Somebody explain this to me. I guess I guess there's a lot of space for that cargo bay in the back of the C1. But like in the C1, this is the cargo bay, right? In, in and, and then right beds, here, maybe in you'd be going into that small hallway. Yeah. Not toilets. And then that small hallway ends like basically and right here. And then there's a cockpit. How is it? I think an overall sense of what it feels like to interact with the vehicle. And it is very common that in this stage, we will make some adjustments from the original plan. As an example, on this ship, yeah, the airlock door in the back. The I think. Made the decision to expand the center corridor, add a little bit more space to the rooms, and as a result, that's going to make it much smoother experience for players to traverse the, in the, the interior of the ship, as well as for AI to traverse the interior of the ship. We've also expanded the main airlock that leads to the enter exit ladder, and up here in the cockpit, we've separated the co-pilot seats a tad bit just to allow players to get in and out a little easier. So with white box, not the prettiest stage in the process, but it is essential that we nail this because it means we'll be able to deliver a beautiful ship that is also extremely fun to play. So yeah, that is, that is mostly what we know of the Zeus so far. Um, and good points made in chat. The C1 has that weird airlock door in the back, that for sure. Um, takes away some space. It also has the component area in the cockpit. There are reasons to see when it's as long as it is. Um, it's a different use of space and they'll balance it based on that use of space and what it's meant for. I'm mostly just, you know, I'm just causing a fuss. They're two different ships and there are going to be other ships in this size range that probably target different use cases as well and, and styles. I'm looking forward to it, man. I'm so excited that they're focusing so hard on this sort of area of ship development. Now, that was our Zeus here. And uh, let's see what else they've got. Retaliator. I made a video about this on the second channel. You could check it out. Just type in Space Tomato 2 Retaliator Modularity. I think this was really just them showing that they will be bringing modularity to the Retaliator. If you don't feel like going and checking out that video, I will give you like a very, very quick look at why I believe that to be the case. Um, ooh, realtor modules. <laughs> uh, if you don't use it and you wanna do research on Star Citizen, make sure to check out starchives.org. Also taking donations. Let's see if I can find this though. You know what, I might actually not be able to find this, but here. Um, listen to this. Um, but, um, all right, and then I'm going to assume it's the same answer for like the underside pods, the. Yeah, still still planned. Um, they they are, those ones are actually technically blocked, um, but that's the, the same tech blocker as we have with the retaliator modules. So uh, when we have that, uh, retaliator modules will probably be the first thing that come online using it and then we can go back through the the catalog of ships that have that same sort of modular room functionality and implement that all right um uh let's see what else do we got as far as the flight ready ships go uh uh okay Defender. so that's that's just a little bit a little itty bitty but i actually we can go back to one of the vehicles we were watching earlier listen to this it says, has there been any progress on modularity since it was last talked about? Yes. Good news at last. <laughs> Good news. Well, I'll, we'll be Good the judge news. of that. We'll be the judge of that. So, uh, You're ready, chat. <laughs> you ready, Eyes chat? on the track, guys. Come on. Yep. Uh, so with the development of the whole sea, uh, we've pretty much figured out the last hurdle. And in fact, Chris is responsible for the test that I got him to do uh, for it, uh, where we can have object containers, which is the interior collection of assets, loaded as an item, loaded onto the ship, because that's how the rear of the whole sea is attached to the ship and moves with it. Uh, what had stopped us technically uh, going any further with this was uh, items inside those object containers couldn't talk to the vehicle it was connected to. Right. So the example of the retaliator, 
the torpedo droppy arms, they're actually part of the exterior of the ship currently because that's the only way they can work. So if we allowed you to swap the modules, no matter what module you had, there'd be a pair of torpedo arms dangling through the middle of it. Uh, Chris did a test where he attached a load of missile racks and torpedoes to the inside of the back of the hull sea, <laughs> which is not going to ship with it. <laughs> Wait, you're saying we're not having a torpedo either. hull sea? Yeah. There, there is a shelf that says, do not submit in very large places. <laughs> um, and the pilot had full control of that, and they could fire them. So after the whole sea ships and we found any more quirks with that setup, we're in a position where, to my knowledge, touch wood, technically there's nothing stopping us doing modularity now. That was the last big hurdle for it. There's nothing technically stopping us from nothing, doing it, but there's nothing, also priorities and, yeah. and things, and building nothing, a team. Nothing technically stopping us. Yeah, nothing, nothing yeah. technically stopping us. Yeah. 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 So, what I, so what I heard was that whole CMX at Citizen Gun. Oh, yeah. Just full of size nine torpedoes. So nothing's really <laughs> stopping the them at this point from getting into modularity, um, which is why it, it seems like they probably are working on it, and they're probably that's what they're kind of hinting at. So this is the Retaliator. Twenty twenty one. Maybe I can find it. This is the Retaliator modules. They had them all done in terms of art and stuff. Like they're, they're literally just waiting for the tech. And what I just showed you was them confirming that the tech is done. So modularity is coming. It's, it's like one step away from confirmed for next year, I think. And these kinds of things where they go and they drop a retaliator, which is already a made ship, which yes, might be getting a gold standard next year, but show our other ships that aren't on this list. Uh, I think it's a pretty obvious, you know, uh, point towards modularity. Same with the... MPUV. All right, let's see what they were saying about these back in 2021. And then because we'd lost a, a, a lift on that side, we then realized we had to make the lift on the other side slightly larger to accommodate essentially two lifts worth of people. So then you've now just got one lift on that side of the ship to get in and a docking collar on the other side to get in. The thing that the Retaliator has is the customizable room modules. And there's a cargo module front and back. A dropship module at the front. They were all brought up to current standards. So when a modularity comes on as a swappable item, they are good to go. That's where we're at with the, the first gold standard ships. Obviously going to go through all the ships, but we are going to focus on the ones that feature heavily in Squadron 42 first. See, that's ships, really key. Like, this is a big update to the Retaliator they're doing. This isn't just the modularity. It's the whole gold standard update. They're moving doors. They're putting new airlocks in. The ship's changing quite a also bit. also took the time to look at the central room and thought, can we improve on this? We decided to remove the top and bottom docking collars and go for a side. And honestly, it, I forget how big the Retaliator is because it, it feels like a one to two person bombing ship, but this thing's huge. Look at the size of this room. Like, it's a wide ship compared to what it kind of looks like. And then you look at the person, you're like, oh, wait. Oh, that's right. It's a big one. So it's a cool ship. I think it's really ugly. <laughs> not going to lie. The Retaliator is one of the weirdest looking ships, in my opinion, but... Uh, it's it's Aegis, and they, they figure out a way to make it look okay. I look forward to seeing modularity in the game, though. That's that's what's so important about this announcement to me. Ships like the Hull Sea and Endeavor and Carrick and uh, a lot of other ones are going to start to have a lot more functionality. It's like seeing tractor beams come in. A whole bunch of other ships are just going to suddenly get more useful. So that'll be cool. Haha, <laughs> and then we have... The one everybody loves. So the Polaris is 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 the big boys adventure, and we're gonna we're gonna get to this update. But let's go back a little bit to the previous updates, so we can watch the little how this story unfolds. I'd like to take you for a walk through the Polaris history. It's a it's a weird one. We're gonna we're actually gonna skip a lot of the history, but I'm gonna start with the announcement because the announcement's kind of cringy. All right, so this just randomly occurred like halfway through this Citizen Con. One year ago, 
our lives were shattered. Also, keep in mind, most people would think this is a trailer because the game was supposed to launch later. But we have not forgotten. United in the face of the Vandal threat, we have dedicated ourselves to creating the universe we have always wanted. A safe and secure UEE for all. Thanks to your continued support in the sale of war bonds, the UEE is proud to announce the Militia Mobilization Initiative authorizing the sale of certain military-grade ships to ensure that civilian militias are properly equipped to defend the Empire in times of need. We will ensure a brighter future for our children. At the forefront of that effort is RSI's newest ship, the Polaris. Combining devastating firepower and searing speed, the Polaris-class Corvette is effective against a wide variety of aggressors and scenarios. From delivering humanitarian aid to tactical operations, the Polaris's ability will make it an essential part of any fleet for years to come. But the Polaris is only the tip of the spear for this grand initiative. A full line of other ships are now available for a limited time. And to support faster mobilization and operational effectiveness, fleet formations are being offered in discounted pre-designed ship teams. So stand in solidarity with the brave men and women who put their lives on the line and join them in protecting the dream that is the UEE, UEE military the call 2016. Yes. So obviously they got a lot more subtle with with the marketing i mean like this is this is marketing yeah this whole thing with the zeus was the same thing but much better <laughs> they weren't like hey buy this but the polaris caught fire after this um people freaking love this ship people still love this ship it's a very cool ship they've been updating us about this over the last i want to say year or so and Up next in this episode when was this from but up next, the our favorite Jared presents about a year ago, actually now, um, a little update on the Polaris. I'll show you this and then we'll get to the very most recent update on this thing. For those who don't know, this is just a very military oriented ship. It's got torpedoes that are like bigger than an Aurora almost. Uh, it, they've, it's got a lot of space for crew. It looks cool. It's a fiery death Dorito. It's just a general big crowd favorite. So here's what we know about the Polaris. The long-awaited, often rumored, Polaris concept model internal layout rework. Now, it's not a series of new concept images like those that were created for the 600i we showcased a few weeks ago, but this is a down-in-the-rough 3D Max model look at the reworked concept mesh to explore the new internal layout so potential pirates can begin plotting out their boarding actions. Enjoy. The Polaris is obviously a really, really old concept. It's been around for a very, very long time. It's one of the more early ships that we did the exterior concept art for. The Polaris came out in, I think, 2017. Uh, lots of features have been added to the game since then that were not known about at that time or couldn't be planned for if they were known about. Like a lot of the older ships, the interior just didn't fit. It, we couldn't get the size, the scale, or the metrics for how we'd want it to appear to actually fit inside the frame that we had. We've really now locked in how we want the interior layout, what the impact of the exterior means, um, but it's still the same Polaris that everyone originally saw and, and, and fell in love with. It just means that now it's kind of fit for purpose, whereas with the initial concepting phase and, and initial layout, it wasn't quite where we needed it to be. Samesies, as in we didn't have it in our hands. 
remains pretty much the same beyond it has got larger to accommodate some of the interior changes. The roll is the same, the key visuals are the same. You may notice, again, some like panel line changes or turret updates. But fundamentally, you look at the, the Polaris now versus then, it's almost indistinguishable uh, aside from that scale change and the role remains identical to what it was before moving on the inside Dude, however, look we at have the a... freaking firepower on this thing like you got two turrets up here these look like size fours maybe maybe size threes these look like size fours one here one here one here if you're in the front of this ship <laughs> that's terrifying and then they've got another turret further back here on the side Look at that, yeah, like if you're in front of this ship, look at how many different turrets can just be facing forward firing, plus these torpedoes, which we'll see soon, which are huge. There's got to be a backwards facing turret or two as well. I don't know. That, that would be a crazy weak spot. I think that might be a turret there, but this ship's nuts, man. I th and it said 24 crew or something like that? Good lord. My hope, and I just like, I, I'd like to take a step up on my sand, my sandbox my <laughs> soapbox i will step into the sandbox allow me my hope for these ships my ultimate hope for capital ships in this in this game isn't for me to go and command 40 people <laughs> i hope that happens someday that would be cool my hope is that they set up mission chains whether it's from mission givers or from joining a faction like let's take uh the crimson fleet faction from from starfield yeah i really hope that you can do something where like you you come to a system and you see a recruiting station on the city right and the uee is there and they're like you can sign up you walk up to them you think it's just a prop like sure whatever you sign up and you get a mission and in this mission you're supposed to report up to the space station you go and you join on a polaris and you get to choose a role on this military Polaris that goes, just goes around different star systems, doing patrols, running into NPC pirates, getting into dogfights. And the whole while, you get to choose to be like a pilot in the, in the, in the dogfighter on the ship. Maybe you get to be like one of the engineers or you get to be somebody who's helping with like logistics or repairs. I can't explain how much I want this game to just say, we're going to give you spaceships that you can be crew on and that can be your story. Because that's, I don't I don't think there's a better way for a space sim to work than that. Uh, I love to fly spaceships, but I feel like everybody wants to at some point be the crew in a in, on the Enterprise or on Serenity or something like that. Yeah, like a tour of duty in, in whatever profession you're interested in. Or maybe you want to do that in a city or a space station. I don't know. But it seems like they have so much opportunity here to allow us to do things that don't require flying. It's almost indistinguishable, uh, aside from that scale change, and the role remains identical to what it was before. Moving on the inside, however, we have a completely different story. Although there wasn't much seen for what the inside was going to look like, we had to remove a lot of that and just start again. We fit the entirety of the interior inside of it while Taking into account the change in component sizes, where we went from size zero all the way up to size 10. Um, whereas now we've got much more kind of uh, distinct categorization of our components. We've now got a, a capital shield generator, a capital power plant, a capital cooler, all to support the actual size of the ship and the scale of it, especially for what its role is within the actual universe. So talking layout, we don't have concept images for every single room within the ship, but I can give you an estimation of what you can expect. Show us the torpedoes. So you start from the bridge, which has been opened up a bit to give you a bit more space and visibility. Behind that, we then have the escape pod section where there's escape pods for all the crew to be able to quickly evacuate the ship. Moving behind that, we then have the captain's quarters and office as well as the CO's um, office. Behind that again, we then have the armory Moving further back, we have the crew bunk room and baths and showers. I actually really Plus like this, that, this we room. Then... This is a cool... The way that the hallway forms out of the, the bunks and makes this shape is really cool. I don't know if this is a standard design on ships, but like ship, like uh, water ships. I know we don't do spaceships that much. We're not quite there yet. Room and baths and showers. Across from that, we then have the wreck area. So it's, it's where the food is, it's where the, the relaxation is for the actual crew of the ship. Moving back further, we then come towards the, the center of the ship, where the actual hangar of the Polaris is. 
and that's had a bit of a size increase so that it's very comfortable to fit things like a saber in it now. Oh, that's good. It seems so small before. On the left and right hand... See, I bet you could fit a val uh, um, legionnaire in here. Inside, on one side, you have the medical facilities. On the other, you have the holding cells for any prisoners or wrongdoers that you might get hold of. And then moving back, you then have the entrance of where engineering is, which spans about two decks. A small section of it is at the rear, which houses some of the more standard components. Then the lower deck of engineering holds the large capsule components for the Polaris. Moving back forward then from the rear, we then have the cargo hold. Moving forward from the cargo area, we then have the torpedo room, which has all of the torpedoes stored and an okay. operation station if anyone uh, needs to make. Can we just like talk about how big these torpedoes are? Like, like, this is actually bigger than a, a starter ship, or at least longer. Look at this. From like right here to... Hold on. There, I actually have, I think, concept image that makes this look a lot... It's a lot clearer. Like, look at this torpedo compared to this man. I don't want to get hit with one of these. And turn on your work down there. So the Polaris is concept complete. We're pretty happy with the updates to it internally and hope you are as well. Uh, and now we are just at the point of scheduling when we can jump it into production. It's naturally a, a large ship, slightly larger than it was. Uh, so it's not going to be a quick endeavor, but we think it's going to be a, a pretty fruitful one by the end of it. He said endeavor. The lessons that we've learned over the years from the evolution. Folks, he said endeavor. Endeavor confirmed 2024. John Crew said it. Of making ships and their interiors have all come into play when we've done the Polaris. And I can't wait for people to be able to see it. Let me show you a little bit more about it. This is their foray into capital ships. This is their finally getting started with actually building capital ship gameplay is going to be almost a different form of playing this game. And they're finally starting to look into that as the single player experience is fleshing out a little bit more and becoming more solid. And so the Polaris is probably going to be a testing ground for them <clears throat> to see how true capital ship gameplay plays. It's also though, not necessarily the first thing they're going to be doing that on like the hammerhead, the Carrick, the Hercules, um, all of those are going to offer us capital ship kind of scenarios in terms of engineering and stuff, but the Polaris will be the first one where they can start to really see how big groups of people work together. And hopefully they can use that in real time to make capital ship gameplay unique from anything else there is on the market. The way we are like planning on tackling the Polaris is not tackling it as one ship, but actually, we want to tackle, well, anyone that knows our backlog knows we have a number of large RSI ships on there. And our kind of plan is that we tackle that as a family of ships. We don't just tackle one of them and then we go off and do something else for six months, a year, come back and do another one, something else, come back and do another one. We want to tackle them all together, one after the other. And what that really allows us to do is just kind of streamline our development process. We're able to... You know, for our more common areas of the ship, we're able to build kits that we're confident in that we can reuse and we can make the most out of them. And then that allows us to focus our development time and our efforts really on the much more unique and the important and exciting areas of each ship. It, tackling them as a family kind of allows us to expedite their development. We leverage the experience that we've got within the team. And it just allows us to, like I say, streamline everything. So. First up, we've got the Polaris. Next up, we've got the Galaxy. Then we've got the Perseus. And that kind of closes out our, most of our large RSI ships. And then we can you know, see what we want to take on after that. Well, I, I think that's pretty much everything we want to talk about today. Um, however, before we go, we're, we're going to... Torsten's already stolen the, the predictable joke here. So we'll do one last thing to show you guys. So let's have a look at the current state of the Polaris in engine in its white box state. All right, so I don't think, well, I think it's possible we'll see the Polaris this next year. I don't think it's guaranteed. They're shooting for it and it could happen, but I think it could slip. The other ships they mentioned there, the Galaxy and the Perseus, no freaking way. 
No, I don't think so. Anyways, here is their uh, last little marketing bit with the Polaris and also a chance for us to see it in a more polished state and to watch missiles go boom. Here you go. Badoom. 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 Man, that'd be a huge loss. I have a spreadsheet for features coming up over the next year. But why don't we take a look at ships as well? Okay, so they said about six new vehicles and ships and half one of 2024. We also have the RSI Polaris, um, which I guess I would put that at quarter four of 2024, I think. Uh, what else have we gone over today? Hit me. Hit me, folks. Come on. We got a new Mirai ship. New Mirai ship as being called the Fat Fury, shall we call it? Bet you that's coming out half one of 2024 give me more predictions come on folks more names more predictions what do we got the zeus zeus mk2 coming out in a quarter that's probably november i want to say of 2024 ph fat you're right you're right what am i doing pay some respects tally rework modularity and for that we'll say the tally and the mpuv Ooh, give me a spicy date for that one. The G12 is a good call, yes. Origin D G12, cool, Ursa. I bet you that's a half one. <laughs> See, these over here, these are all things that they've said. They said all of these features were half one of this year, and all these things are in-game. And these don't have dates, they were just said mostly next 12 months. This over here, these are going to be all of my predictions, so let's not... Nobody take this as what CIG is saying. Let me very clearly call this my own big brain predictions for your pleasure. Ah, let's say our. You guys are here, right? What else we got? No galaxy. No, nah, I don't think so. I do not believe so. The Apollo. RSI Apollo. God, I have no idea when that would be. Legionnaire, yes. And there's one more we didn't go over. Don't worry, we're not done here. We gotta hit the um, our good friend, the Raylan. Anvil, Legionnaire, I bet you that's a half too. Because they're gonna need to have some form of hacking for that. The Vulcan? Imagine if they released the Vulcan and weren't gonna tell us. Surprise, RSI or anvil ship i'm just gonna say 2024 for that rsi apollo have to 
Actually, we don't even have a confirmation for the RSI Apollo. I'm going to leave that blank for now. Tumbrel bike. Good call. Tumbrel bike. How much is this? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 that we know of. G12 has a few different variants. Man, I'm missing something. I'm going to say the Gatak Raylan is a maybe. I'm definitely missing stuff here. It comes down to the, the signs, and we're not going to know what the signs are until late January when they release all of the news about what their updated roadmaps and timelines are. Especially looking at the PU teams, the NA and EU PU teams, their gameplay is probably going to point towards some of the ships that are coming out. You know, we don't know. Like, we might see refinery ships in 2024. We might see the, the Expanse. Um, might even see the Arastra. Because this stuff was done in terms of design and engineering. We just haven't seen really what they're doing in terms of gameplay. It was on the monthly reports at the beginning of this year. And if something was on the monthly reports at the beginning of this year, and then didn't get worked on, if they're bringing 700 devs over from Squadron 42, you can bet it's going to get picked back up. So refining might be something that we see this year too. And um, if if Squadron 42 does come out this year, that is such a big freaking if, but let's just, let's put it this way. Um, Aegis Idris, Aegis Javelin, oops. These will, uh, and then what, Vanduul, Scythe, I'll count these as reworks because they're pretty big deal reworks. Vanduul Blade, Vanduul Glaive, and I think the Vanduul Stinger were the ships that they showed. And these are all Squadron 42 year, we'll just call it. In fact, why don't we just include the Anvil Hawk? Call it a rework. Um, Freelancer. I, we could make this a very robust list, to be honest. We can call this a rework. The, the Saber is going to get a rework. Um, the Retaliator is going to get a rework. 600i rework. That's a good one. We should actually touch on that real quick. Um, I don't know if this would be, if this would be something that they would try to fit in this year. They've talked about it in the past though. Slightly infamous in their mishandling of the original 600i rollout. Let's find out what went wrong the first time around and take right. a look at how- So here's one of the biggest reworks a ship is going to see in Star Citizen so far. concept rework. Can't confirm this will be a 2024 edition, though. The, the 600i, when it first, first came out, was one of those ships that we talked about in the past that has had uh, a troubled development. The original 600i, it, its its core issue was what we prioritized for space. The rear was a massive habitation area where there was pool tables and bars. And then you had the very front of the ship, which had the bridge and the, the captain's quarters. And then it forced the entirety of the core gameplay loops of the ship to live in the middle of it. So you had this small module where everything needed to happen. If you're designing spaceships, you, you kind of need to make sure that everything's there for a reason. And, and when we get to the point where we've got kind of big unused areas of the ship that don't really support a functionality, it just feels like a wasted opportunity. The 600i was done relatively early for Origin as a brand. We, we, we'd we had the 300, and it was the first really big Origin ship that we decided to do. Since then, we've obviously tackled much larger Origin ships with the 890, and throughout the course of the 890, the Origin style completely evolved from what it was, which you had some very technical and wooden surfaces, to instead have this lovely transition that goes between them, which can be seen across the 890, the, the clear but smooth divide between the different sections of the ship. In terms of reworking the 600i, we had a sort of very clear brief. We want to bring it up to modern day standards. So there's a lot of features that didn't exist in the game there or weren't accounted for at the time uh, to integrate those into the ship now and then to also make better use of the space because anyone that's been on board a 600i knows there's a lot of there's a lot of walking and going up and down to get to where you want to, and it doesn't really need to be like that. 
600 i is huge you guys remember when they introduced the 600 i as the uh as a competitor to the connie but it's just so much bigger currently the 600 i is concept complete there's a couple of rooms which haven't had full concept work done on them such as the crew quarters but for the most part every room has had a complete and utter rework the big change for the module uh, section is its placement so rather than being the sort of central core of the ship that you had to go through to get to the back half of the ship uh, it is now in the rear section of the ship which allowed us to move the the common shared areas to the central uh, section we did that change because it just makes the flow of the interior better um, when you have a 600 i regardless of which uh, module you have you know the the front half of the ship is a consistent experience and then the, the gameplay alterations with that module is constrained to a very specific area at the back. So the best way to think of the 600i layout is between three parts. You have the very front of the ship, which is the bridge and the captain's quarters. For the most part, they've remained mostly the same. There's been a few tweaks to the layout of the chairs on the bridge, but generally that hasn't changed very much. The captain's quarters is almost the same as it was before, except it's flipped around. The bathroom moved from one side to the other. The reason for that is directly behind that the lobby area on the top deck. We now have a small docking collar with space for a few um, suits. And the opposite side of that is now a lift to take you between two floors into the rear, uh, the exterior of the ship. Directly behind that, which used to be the modular section, we now have on the top deck the crew habitation area. So it starts off with a large open shared communal space where there's places to eat, uh, make food, and then to see now that that's for private crew. that is a winning design not just because it looks good but it screams 890 it's they've done a great job of it's funny that they they introduce a ship and then they introduce another ship and then they were like wait that old ship isn't great let's make it look more like this other ship we made but they did a fantastic job of taking the styles of the 890 jump and applying them to the 600 this looks so much more luxury than what the 600 is and it reminds me a lot of the 890 jump. Places to I like eat. This. Like from the stairs to the outcropping here to the um, just the, the general styling of this floor below this one. I think it looks a lot better. But for those who are, you know, 600i owners, what do you guys think of what you've been seeing of this? Uh, make food. Dude, luxury people don't need handrails. All right. You ever heard of a, a fancy person wanting to put their hand on something? No use anti-gravity technology to keep them on their feet or you don't try at all and then to the side of that there's four private <laughs> which to be honest they're probably not trying at all <laughs> the crew bedrooms the floor beneath that now is where engineering and all the components that allow the ship to function have been moved to I think very similar to what we've done on the 400i where you have the the separate engineering section beneath directly behind that we then have the ship modular section we'll start with the expedition version so on the top deck, at the very, very top, we have the armory. There's a huge armory with plenty of extra suit lockers for you and your friends to take extra equipment, depending on what you might encounter. Behind that, we then have the hologlow that allow you to do the exploration. On the middle deck, we then have the medical bay, which will have a medical suite similar to that as the Carrick. It'll have a tier two med bed. Beside that, we then have the secondary cargo hold. So this cargo hold, it's more readily accessible for the crew. So it's more for your day-to-day -day supply. So if, if you want to have a box full of your food or your snacks, that, that's where you put it instead of down in your main cargo hold. Because you don't want to go rooting through your garage just to find that random pen that you've left. On the bottom deck of the expedition version, we then have the main cargo hold and garage. So obviously as This is um to give you a little bit of perspective of how this how big this area is, you can fit a Nova tank here now. Like they've, when we say this was a competitor to the Connie and it felt wrong because the ship was so much bigger, this makes way more sense that like this looks much bigger than what I think of as a 600i. So I'm glad that they've been able to take better space of it. Looks like you got enough space for a big vehicle as well as cargo afterward. This is going to be a much more common ship, I think, for people to use as like a group exploration and general purpose kind of ship after this rework because there's way more space and ability to do stuff with this. Good work on this. I really hope this comes next year. Still can't confirm though. Of the expedition version, we then have the main cargo hold and garage. So obviously, as you've seen from the pictures from the recent Inside Star Citizen, 
it is much, much larger than it was before, with a much, much larger lift to fit much larger vehicles in it. In there, there's also two small lifts, one to allow you to bring cargo up to the main cargo area, and then there's the smaller one that goes through the three decks. Moving on to the Touring variant, we get a completely different experience. The Touring's primarily split between two main decks, though one of the decks is across two floors. So the upper deck brings you out into the large lobby area. From the lobby area, you can choose to go up the side staircases to the main meeting area slash eating room, as well as a bar. And if you go left and right from there, you can get to the private guest suites. Private guest suites are very large and luxurious. They also come with their own skate pods. The lower deck is a spa. So the spa has a pool, a sauna, bar, as well as a kitchen for the crew to actually be able to make food for the guests. So whilst we're kind of doing a complete or almost a complete rework of the interior, on the exterior of the ship, we're trying to keep it as true to how it is now as we possibly can. There will be some slight changes. We'll need to move the hangar bay doors a little bit. Um, there'll be some additional kind of cutouts or escape pods, and we need to fit the airlock in properly. Um, so there will be some minor changes, but overall we're trying to keep it as, as close to what you see now as a 600 as we can. So next step is essentially just finding a slot in the production schedule for it. It's about finding the space where we can start doing the production art and designers can get on board with actually making it come alive again. We're all super excited with the work that we've actually done on it. It's just trying to actually get the schedule to align so that we can begin the work on it. It's not going to start today or tomorrow, <laughs> but it is something we're looking to try and include <laughs> as soon as we can. Or, you know, uh, I don't know, what does this even say? 14 months later? As we can. When was this? I think people should this be... This is November 22. So yeah, it's like 14 months ago or so. Um, don't know what's going on with a 600 i rework. They haven't really talked much about it, I think. But I think that's mainly all the things... All the things I would consider might come out next year. Again, I don't think... I don't think a lot of this will. Especially if Squadron 42 isn't coming out. But I'll keep writing this down. We'll, we'll make this a little bit more understandable. All the things that probably won't happen will be towards the top. I think we've got a good outlook for next year in terms of both ships and features, especially if they're moving more devs into the PU. But like I keep saying, we won't know about that until February. So until then, I'll just keep on speculating and throwing out some theory crafting and stuff. And hopefully you enjoy that. Mm -hmm.